I recently got a Pentium 4 machine. Uh, if you can believe this, I haven't actually had one in years. I don't remember when I got rid of my last P4. Uh, and the reason I wanted one is because I test a lot of PC hardware and software. You don't see it because a lot of it doesn't amount to a video. Uh, but I do spend a lot of my time plugging in old PC stuff and trying to run old games and, and applications and whatnot. And if you're doing that, you really need to have one machine from each major era of the PC's history, because otherwise you'll run into odd edge cases. I mean, software intercompatibility within the Windows ecosystem, which is largely what I'm concerned with, is excellent. You can run the majority of software that's ever been developed for Windows on the current version of Windows. It's been like this for 25 years. The exceptions are 16-bit software, video games, and drivers, which are all three things that I am constantly having to run. So this is a problem for me. There's also the XP factor. Windows XP is just sort of a sweet spot for compatibility. Anything that isn't limited to a DOS compatible version of Windows will almost unquestionably run well on Windows XP unless it's from the last six or seven years. So if you have a machine that XP runs well on, it's a perfect test bed for a lot of old stuff. While there are Core 2 and newer systems that will run XP, a lot of the time it's just janky. Stuff doesn't work for unclear reasons. So I wanted a Pentium 4. That is the home of Windows XP. So I put a call out for anyone uh, who had a P4 to get rid of, and a friend and patron offered me this. It is one of the strangest looking machines that I can recall ever having seen, uh, just, just visually speaking. Uh, it's not a remarkable piece of equipment. There's nothing spectacular going on here, uh, but I just wanted to introduce you to this machine because it'll be showing up in future videos uh, and also tell you about a couple of quirks it has that are kind of interesting. Oh, it also houses a bit of history about the Pentium 4 that you might not know about, so I figured I'd share that as well. So I used to work in PC recycling, and while I was there, I saw probably 10,000 computers spanning a couple decades. Some of them were really weird, but in all that time, I never saw anything quite like this. Uh, it's all made of plastic, first off, which is unusual. The OEMs like Compaq, Gateway, etc., Dell in particular, they would make very plasticky computers. But this doesn't seem to have a brand of any sort on it. And most off-the-shelf PC cases were made entirely out of sheet steel except for the front panel and occasionally a piece of trim somewhere. This, however, it's plastic on all sides. Not only the front and the sides, but the top and the back. All plastic everywhere. It really looks like it should be a Dell, but it's not, as far as I can tell. I think the reason that it's all plastic is uh, pretty much because they, they got carried away. This egg-like design is reminiscent of some trends in computer designs in the 90s. If you look at like a, like a 1998 Compact Presario, for instance, it's got some of the same kind of bulbous affect going on, but nothing like this. I mean, look at this. The, the, the top of this leans back, what, three, four inches compared to the bottom? This swoop is so extreme that there's no way they could have formed the case itself entirely out of sheet metal. The sides, of course, have to be curved heavily to accommodate this. It can't really just be a trim piece on the front. Uh, the top has to be heavily sculpted uh, in order to permit your hand to fit under this handle here. So once they had done all of that, I, I guess they just figured, well, we might as well make a piece for the back as well. It doesn't really do anything. It just makes the whole thing look a little more put together than it would otherwise. Now, I suspect that the extreme curvature is why this case is built upside down, uh, by which I mean the five and a quarter bays are down here uh, with the floppy drive below them. Normally, these would be rotated 180 degrees up here. And then if you look on the back, you can see that the power supply is down here while the motherboard is against what people would typically consider the wrong side of the case. So this entire case is built 180 degrees rotated. Now, I've certainly seen computers that flip the motherboard and power supply for a variety of reasons, but I'm searching my memory. I'm not sure I've ever seen this. This is a weird decision, but it's not like they could put them up here. It, it, there'd just be no way to get them to interface with the front panel. So, I mean, I guess at that point they could have said, hmm, maybe this isn't such a great idea. But it was the 90s, so they just plowed ahead. Now, of course, the first thing you noticed wasn't any of that. It was the handle, right? It's awesome. It's also terrible, which is the same thing you can say about the handle on the Power Mac G3, G4, G5. Uh, it's a very cool idea to put a handle on a PC case, but in order for it to look cool, it also has to be very uncomfortable. So this is actually not very pleasant to hold the machine by, uh, nor is it even particularly balanced. It, it tends to hang backwards, 
which is still better than the Power Mac, which dangled from the handle since it's at the corner, uh, but it's still not particularly comfortable. And of course the hard edges dig into your hand. And I also don't remotely trust it. ABS plastic in the late 90s wasn't nearly as bad as the stuff they had in the 80s. It doesn't tend to crumble to dust. And this feels pretty robust, but I don't think I would have trusted this when it was new, just on principle. It is still good decoration though. I mean, the, the swoop looks great uh, and it adds a little bit of extra flair to the top of the machine. And I also dig the, the paint job. It's pretty much the same color as the original Sony Walkman in, in like the late 70s. Uh, it also, it kind of looks like the disc cam, but I guess that's more of a purple than a blue. Now, while the handle is impractical, but looks good, I think the power and reset buttons up here are impractical and ugly. Uh, they don't actually work very well, in addition to not looking very well integrated into the case. Uh, if you try and push on them from the wrong angle, they just jam. And even if you're pushing from the right angle, if your finger isn't very tiny, it sticks on the bezel. So you have to rotate your finger and push in from the front. It, and even then it, it kind of jam sideways sometimes these these suck but anyway that's most of the outside and that's pretty much what a pc case is generally speaking is just an outside it's usually not that much to talk about uh however before i open this up and show you what's inside we do need to talk about its name see with a case this unusual uh i figured it was an oem at first but i couldn't find any oem names on anywhere no compact dell etc uh the only identifying mark anywhere on it is this sticker that says the edge Unsurprisingly, Googling that didn't get me very much other than, well, you know, this guy. But I kept looking all over the machine, and I did find on the back a little sticker that says, Refurbished by Certified Casey Technicians. That was a weird enough term that I was able to track it down to a product. In its previous life, this machine was apparently part of a system called Casey Enterprise, made by a company called Patterson Dental Supply. That was momentarily exciting because I thought, well, maybe it's for dental records or x-ray imaging or something. It could have some intriguing software or even hardware. No, um, Casey Enterprise is a kiosk. You put it in your waiting room so your patients can learn about their teeth. As far as I could tell, it plays like little flash animations and videos that this company Patterson Dental puts together. Uh, and it also gives access to a like streaming video network called Smile Channel a name I don't love. The idea is you hook this up to a TV in your waiting room and it continuously runs looping infotainment, also about teeth. Their current product is of course clown-based, so I'm guessing it just uses ordinary commodity PCs for the kiosks, but this one is from the 2005 iteration of the software, at which point internet connections were like a couple megabits on average, not nearly fast enough to stream a lot of data from the vendor continuously. So this is an on-site server. The idea is you'd install the software on this from CD, park it in your office, plug it into the TV to run Smile Channel. It had a graphics card in it with a composite video out. Uh, and then you'd hook it up to a network and plug in multiple kiosks as if multiple patients were going to spend their time doing this. I'm assuming that it was a subscription product uh, that Patterson would periodically send you a new disc as long as you were subscribed to update it with new videos and whatnot. Um, but I have no idea if Smile Channel streamed off of the internet using like a low bitrate codec or if it was being played off of a file on the disc and, and just looping. No idea. So it's a deeply boring piece of equipment after all, which is fortunate because it means I can repurpose it with a clean conscience. However, I can't strip it of its identity. It's the edge and the edge it will stay. However, I can't figure out why Patterson called it that. It doesn't make any sense. And I don't feel like explaining it over and over and over. So... It's this edge instead, and this edge it will stay. Congratulations, you've met the edge. Now let's open it up. A cool thing about this case being all plastic is that they were able to make it toolless. You can actually take all the panels off without removing any screws. Just pull down those tabs. There you go. To take the side off, you push in on these tabs. And as is typical for these plastic case sides you see on OEM machines, it's got tabs at the bottom that hold it in a little rail. So you don't actually have to get them into the notches like you do on most PC cases and, and then slide forward. You just have to set this down onto the rail down here. However, a thing that sucks about this is that the front half of the bezel here actually has to land ahead of this bezel here because there's a, a ridge right there. So you can seat this thing in here at this point and it won't slide forward because of this guy right here. And if you get it just ahead of that, 
you can still have it get stuck because it doesn't go over the ridge at the front. So ultimately not a winning design. But anyway, with it open, you can see that everything really is completely upside down. Motherboard's up here, power supply is down here, and then uh, here's the drives. If you were to just flip this 180 degrees, it would look like a normal computer. It's also, um, unfortunately, really inconvenient. I'm not super sure why. It should have just as much space in it as any other mini ATX system. Uh, but I think maybe this case is a little smaller than I, I thought it was from the outside dimensions because I find it really tough to get my fingers in here to work with the hard drive and, and CD-ROM cables. It's also kind of tough to get to a number of the cables and connectors on the motherboard, but that's just bad motherboard design. Now, you might actually notice that there's not actually any hard drive bays in here. Um, this is the floppy bay, and there is a floppy drive in there, uh, but there's no hard drive bay because the previous owners apparently ripped it out in order to protect their data. You can see the tabs where it would have gone right up here, and that's impossible to replace. So what I ended up doing is, when I went in here to replace the CD-ROM, because it came with a bad one, I got a rail kit and put the hard drive in the other five and a quarter bay, which is kind of a pain, but also sort of par for the course in this era. I remember having to do this with a lot of computers for one reason or another. I also put a couple of gigs of decent RAM in here. You see it's got the heat sinks on there, which were not typical at the time. Uh, and I put a GeForce 6200 in here, which is not really that great a card, but it was readily available and cheap. You can also tell that this is a socket 478. I believe this style of cooler was only ever used on the 478. If you're not aware, the Pentium 4 holds the distinction of being the only CPU in history to come in three different sockets over its lifetime. The original socket was the PGA Socket 423, which was about the size of a Pentium 3. Then there was the Socket 478, which was only about yay big, and that constituted, as far as I know, the vast majority of P4s ever made. Uh, and then it went to socket 775, the exact same socket as the Core 2 chips that followed it. In fact, there were a lot of motherboards that could do either P4s or Core 2s. It was always weird to me that the P4 apparently lasted so long in the market that it actually managed to go through three different eras of computer technology. But anyway, this one is socket 478, so it's very middle of the road, very average. I'll get to more of that in a couple minutes. Now, ironically, since I was repairing it, the CD-ROM I put in here to replace the original broken one is also broken. So I'm going to go ahead and finish taking this apart so I can replace the CD-ROM again. Now, a thing about plasticky cases is that typically they've got a pair of tabs to release the front panel over here, and then the tabs on this side you don't need to touch. It just swings out and then, and then pops off. But in this design, apparently, because the two sides come off without any tools, the vendor decided that it would be okay to put the tabs for the front on both sides as well. So there's one here and one on the opposite side. Irritating. Didn't need to do that. And then it's also a huge pain to get this thing to come off because the tabs at the bottom really don't want to come loose. There we go. Oh, that's still a little dusty. Now, uh, as a follow-up on a video from some months ago, I said that I couldn't find a good anti-static bench brush, uh, a good brush for just scrubbing the dust out of a computer. Uh, and eventually, after a lot of searches, I was able to track one down on Amazon. I have no idea if it's the real deal. Um, it says it is, and uh, it says approved static control on it, and the listing said it was anti-static. I have no idea how to test that, but it beats using just any old thing. Don't need a static brush for this, but it's just convenient. One thing I hate about old computers and a lot of old stuff is what I call hard dust. Like it's it's dust that's in corners. It's definitely dust. It, it's not dirt per se, but for some reason, you know, you hit it with a brush and it just won't it just won't come out. You really have to attack it. Hate that. Dust should just come out. For further indications that this case is not a stellar design, take a look at the hinge situation going on with the power reset buttons here. Look at this. <laughs> Isn't that absurd? They're just flying out there, man. I, I've never seen standoffs this long in, in a plastic casting. That's, that's just ridiculous. Now, I almost made a mistake because in order for the CD-ROM to meet up with the front panel, there's a very specific spacing you have to achieve. Uh, so if you forget where the screws are, it takes like five to ten minutes to try and finesse the thing into the perfect position. So I need to make sure to mark this. Okay. That sounds like it'll work. Floppy drive still works. Outstanding. 
Now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this motherboard. The motherboard is an Asus P4S533MX, which uh, by 2005, I think was kind of an ancient board. I think it came out in more like 2003, uh, but it's possible that you know they were just still selling this in 2005 using the same components. It came with a Celeron 2.53 in it, and if you've never used one, um, they're not great chips. Uh, they basically make a Pentium 4 class 2.5 gigahertz processor behave like a 450 megahertz Pentium 3. They're completely unusable. I would show you just how slow it was, but I already got rid of that chip and swapped it out for a Pentium 4 2.5, which is the same chip, just would double the cache like it's supposed to have, and it runs way snappier. Since this is a mid-era board, it only has a 533 megahertz front side bus, which means you're mostly limited to a 2.5 gig chip. They did make a 2.8 that could run at 533, but I don't know if it really had much benefit at that speed. I also have no idea what price point this board was at or how it was perceived when new, uh, because I can't find any mention of it online. Not, not just no reviews, but no mention anywhere, really, other than Asus's website. People have suggested to me that that's because it's actually very cheap. It uses an SIS chipset, which at this time was considered the lowest of the low. I, I don't remember if they've gotten any better since then, but at this time it was the crappiest chipset for only the lowest grade boards. So the fact that it isn't mentioned might be because it's a budget board that only went into the cheapest pre-builds, who knows. I can find some info on the plain P4S533 without the MX, uh, but that one doesn't have the special quality that this one does. If you take a look at the RAM slots here, you'll see that the empty ones have two notches in them, which means that they take the original single data rate SD RAM, uh, what we retroactively call SDR now, which is interesting because the Pentium 4 is not supposed to work with SDR. See, when the P4 first came out, it was so much faster than the CPUs that had preceded it that it really needed quicker memory, which had not yet been invented. So Intel took the highly controversial decision of using a new type of memory produced by a company called Rambus, by which it was commonly known, although the correct term for it was supposed to be RDRAM. Everyone hated it. This is a quick video, so I'm not going to deep dive this or tell you that these are the hard facts, but the colloquial interpretation of what happened is that RDRAM ran extremely hot, was very inefficient and cost way too much. There's theories about why all those things happened, but to give you an idea, RDRAM was so hot that it had to have permanently installed heat sinks, which was a thing you wouldn't really see on most memory for years after that, not until really high performance DDR started coming out. This stuff was so expensive that a lot of people just didn't want to upgrade to P4s just so they wouldn't have to buy RAM bus. So Intel and a couple other vendors decided to take a really interesting step they developed new chipsets which enabled the Pentium 4 to operate using SDR memory, which shouldn't have been possible and kind of wasn't. Intel produced the 845 chipset and VIA produced the uh, P4X266. There was also later the uh, SIS651, which does the same thing. That's what's on this motherboard, but I don't think it came out for a year or two after that. An interesting thing about these is that uh, while the Intel chipset just provided SDR support, the VIA chipset actually implemented both SDR and DDR, so that once DDR did become available, motherboard manufacturers could start putting the right slots on their boards, and people would start being able to upgrade without having to wait for a new chipset to come out. Of course, the P4 really was too fast for SDR, and I'm told that it basically ran like garbage. I don't exactly know what the trade-offs were like, but my guess is that if you wanted to buy a new computer and you didn't want to buy a previous generation Pentium 3 just to get memory you could actually afford, then it was a more palatable decision to buy, say, a 2.0 gigahertz Pentium 4 and then put RAM in it that would bump it back in performance to more like a 1.4 gigahertz chip because that beat buying a 1 gigahertz Pentium 3 and being stuck with it forever. I'm not sure if the memory bottleneck was that intense or more intense than that. I haven't gone and looked into it, but I can tell you that this was a wild time in computer history and people were making some really weird decisions to work around the limitations of the market. So now we get back to this board here and what makes it unusual compared to all the others. If you take a look in there again, you'll see that the two slots that aren't populated have two slots, so those are SDR RAM slots. But if I take out one of the sticks, you'll see that it has one slot and is in fact DDR3200. This board actually supports both standards, although not simultaneously. The manual says it won't operate with both SDR and DDR, which makes sense. I'm guessing their intent was that you could use whatever SDR RAM you had laying around for the time being, and then once DDR came out, you wouldn't have to buy a new motherboard with DDR slots. You could just take your SDR RAM out, put your DDR RAM in, and get an upgrade without replacing any other components. 
Now, if that actually worked, that's pretty cool. Of course, it did have a limitation. The other boards that supported DDR at this time, like the VIA chipset ones, could take at least three, possibly four sticks of DDR, but this can only do two of either type. So you were limited in how much maximum RAM you could put in even after you upgraded to DDR. Of course, if you were buying a board this cheap, there was a good chance you never planned on maxing it out anyway. Now, I'm sure that the SDR bottlenecks the hell out of the machine, but from what I've heard about SIS chipsets, it seems very possible that it didn't run all that well with the DDR either. Now, I couldn't find any benchmarks online uh, demonstrating the difference between the SDR and DDR memory, uh, and I don't really know how to do any benchmarks at all. So I was going to do something dumb and just turn the machine on, start Unreal Tournament 99, see how it performs, and then switch over to the SDR memory and see if it just runs like a Pentium. You know, that, that would be enough. If it just ran like total crap, then cool, we'd be able to see the bottleneck. Then I found out that I only have about a half a gig of SDR RAM, which isn't really enough. Uh, and then I found out that UT99 is frame limited to 60 and I couldn't find any way to lift that. So I guess I don't really know how to do that benchmark either. But hey, that wasn't really the point anyway. I just wanted you to meet the edge. Because in future videos, you're going to see this and you'll be like, what's the guy from U2 doing here? So now you've met the edge. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, if you're new to this channel and have no idea why you should care about me, uh, trust me, this thing is going to get up some exciting hijinks, and these cards are why. So I suggest you subscribe, because when I do that video, you're going to have a good time. I guarantee it. To all my patrons who support me, like these folks here, uh, and to Cordtoll in particular for giving me this machine, thank you so much. I couldn't do this without you. And to everybody else, thanks for watching.